another first time visitor whom we are very happy to have, uh, Kristen. I'm also very happy to be here, thank you. Um, I'll be talking about some interesting ongoing work in the surgery of weeks ago. Yeah, I will. The sort of working title we have is to prevent the lines that are involved from the protocols. sort of suggests I want to draw a parallel between certain types of quantum information theory, the protocols that are called sequentializable, and some things in categorical semantics, namely classical structures, and in particular in a completely quantum setting. And I'm not sure if this is such a good idea, but to get you in the mood, I thought I'd start with um, having a look at one of these quantum protocols in precise phase estimation. The problem in phase estimation is uh, I give you some unitary gate, black box, you can put stuff in it and stuff comes out, but that's all you know. And I guarantee that there's an eigenvector, well, let's say your black box is U. Um, let's say you know, around two qubits. And we know that there's some eigenvector X, say. So we know that there's some eigenvector, and the problem is I give you u, you have to find the uh, eigenvalue that corresponds to the given vector. So you can get told what the vector is? Yes. So I give you u and I give you x. You have to find angle theta in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, now it might sound like a bit of an artificial problem, but it's actually used all over the place. It's sort of subroutine in Shaw's algorithm. And I'm also not very clear on the details, but you can use it to synchronize two clocks between Alice and Bob. Assuming that they have clocks that run um, at the same the tick at the same time, but they might be off by a bit. They are very far apart and they can't communicate, but still, if they share an entangled pair, they can sort of encode their clock and the, the angle of the, the qubit that they have, and then you can estimate the difference between the two angles in this way. So this is a useful protocol. And the standard way these people do that looks like this. write it down in the circle language and then I'll take you through what it means. Oh, so sorry. So in general, you give given any u, right? But you can take this given eigenvector as a basis. So we can assume that u is of the form I take the z. So z is a fully matrix. So this is what they call a quantum circuit. Um, you should read it as just the composition of you know, putting stuff together in a lab bench, some gates and some two wires here going from left to right. So the input of this wire is the plus state. So that's then you compare for the second wire the zero state. Input them. This is a controlled not gate. So this was a fully Have a look at this good question. So this is the gate. And this is sort of a control thing. If I put in zero here, then nothing will happen to the second. So if I put zero here, nothing will happen. If the control bit is wrong, so in these two cases. Second bit will 
an aggravation of all the controls of x. So just looking at this wire, we input some state, we hit it with this x matrix, it looks a bit strong, so the not date, and the not looks a not. And this is just a control. We only apply x if the control bit at this point happens to be 1. This means measuring in the x -ray. So what's going on here? We're reading this from left to right, so here is our input state. Let's have a look at what happens over here. And zero is plus on this one and zero on this one. So we write that as plus zero. after we do this control not here. Yeah. Control. So this is a superposition. So let's have a look at this one first. Here the control bit is zero, so nothing happens to the set. It just keeps in place. And on this one, the control bit is one, so the second one flips around. And we end up with one one. You might notice that this is maximally untangled state. Now, okay, so now we're at this point, then we apply our unknown gates to the second qubit. So the result is called type 2. So again, we're linear, so let's look at this one first. So we apply, so this was a Z matrix, right? So B210. We apply the Z is and is then minus two theta. So we hit sign one with this gate. this gate now the second part. Oh, oh, it's it's oh, yeah. oh that might be good. So no, 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 no. want e to the i 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 Yeah, okay. It should be a plus. And the rest of my stuff will be able to do that's not really good. Alright, so now we're at this point, then we apply C0 again. Control 0, C0 3. So again, this scalar factor is just doing things because we're linear. Control beta 0, so nothing happens. This scalar factor stays over here. Here the control bit is 1, so the second one flips. Right, and then finally we measure, I'm really interested in this one, this is just we have to do something. We measure the first qubit in the x basis. So that means we have to write, rewrite this first. We need to separate this, this second wire out. So we want to measure this thing here in the x basis. So we call this one. Uh, so we want the right side in, in, this, in the eigenbasis of this matrix. The eigenbasis of this matrix is minus and plus. So if you remember that
So I just rewritten this on a little bit different basis, and now I can measure it easily. Yes. Uh, the probability cosine of psi will get something which we know out, and with probability something else we will get plus L. So if we do this often enough, we can estimate cosine of theta. Right? So, and then we can hence estimate theta itself, so we know what the angle will be. That was the point of this angle itself. So. Um, yeah, so the point of, it looks a bit complicated like this, and the point is, I didn't really speak about how closely you can approximate the water rate convergences. If you do some more clever things on this side, if you do some more infant forms, these are sites that you can get the rate of convergence off. But the principle we're just interested in, if you can do it, not how fast you can do it. So if you've got that, then it turns out you can simplify this circuit a whole lot. That's why it's going to be sequentializable. Oh, I should also mention. So now I use two qubits, but if you add some more, say three. Another one of those. Then you can use the precision too. But again, that has to do with how fast things are. ways to do that, but I'm very low ground and not so technical in these circuits, so let's just see what happens if I put in all the possible inputs. And if there are any equivalent, then it's what you get the same output, right? So right here we put in 0, 0, nothing is controlled with 0, so nothing happens, so we did the second one with Z. Remember Z does nothing on the, on the left column, so let's stay the same. We have 0, 0 here. The fall width is still 0, so nothing happens, so 0, 0 comes out. Yeah, similar thing here. Control width is 0, so nothing happens. Now Z puts a minus on the, on the 1 here, but then we end up with minus 0, 1. So this one, control width is 1, so this one flips. We're left with 1, 1 here. And Z flips the 1 again with a minus. Control width is still 1, and we end up with this one. And here the control width is 1, so the second one flips. We have 1, 0 here. Here it says there's nothing on the 0, so this is the same. And the control width flips it again, so we end up with this one. Okay, so this is what that circuit represents. Now look at this one. We can play the same game. Let's have a look. Start with 0, 0. Z does nothing on the second zero, so here we still have zero, zero. This is a control of something, and the control bit is zero, so nothing happens. End up with zero, zero. First of all, we have zero, one. Z flips the one to a minus. The control bit is still zero, so we have just a minus sign. If you put in one, zero, Z doesn't do anything on the zero. But now the control bit is one, so we have to apply minus on the second one, so we also still get a minus. And the last one, if we put in 1, 1, Z puts a minus on the second wire. But now the control with 1, and we have to put an additional minus, so the two cancel out. So these two circuits do the same thing, so they similar circuits. And we can rewrite them another time. this one. Yeah. Now all of a sudden there's no entanglement whatsoever. These two wires are completely separate. This is a bit of toy case. I'm really interested in the was it E to the I set. And I don't know like this kind of reasoning, so it turns out that circuit turns out to be the same as this one. That's so we just have like here and this is again the same as this one. So now it's 
actually something funny happened here. We used to have first set up entanglement, do something on the second, and then kill the entanglement, if you like, and transfer it back. But what happened here is we're only acting on the first line. The second is just there, you know, so you have to pad up and do it at the same time. So even if it, it looks like you have sort of a maximally entangled state here, that doesn't play a role at all in what the protocol does. So in that sense, we can say this protocol is sequentializable. This one, let me write it in. Star is equivalent to just doing a bunch of these gates next to each other. Okay. Um, Basically, if you would have used classical structures to prove that, then we are taking three seconds. I know, that's the whole point of my talk, actually. Anyway, so the, the point of this phase estimation is it's sequentializable, so you can sort of create entanglement for time, like you create space and time. Let's try to model the same thing categorically. Is, is this part of the space change as applied to the whole system? We already know, but it turns out that phase change are the only thing that you can do this so. And I should also mention that we're talking about perfect sequentialization. There's some noise in these channels that those different considerations take into account. We're not very sure how things should be all that for. Sorry, but what do you Find this type of sequentializability well now. I think you're going to cite me in this paper. <laughs> uh, I think I do that. So the second part of this uh, will be used on also classical structures. And here I wasn't really sure how much I should say given the audience. I guess I should probably introduce them. Uh, so the point is if you have. Uh, over space where the base is E I, well that's why the point in the the base is E I and the base is E the space H. Then you can make a map H to H tensor H and just map to I to I I. So by map, you can have a look at what kind of properties it has. So these things are called Fabini's algebras, so classical structures. These groups like the 
And as you might expect, of course, because I introduced them using bases, these things in the categorical picture play the role of the classical information. Well, that's why I thought this talk was only since we went away for a workshop on classical and quantum communication. And then, Remember the the circle that was down here started by making maximum and time distinct. And, and uh, in this kind of representation, we have more information. So we go left to right now to make it look the same. Um, that's this kind of thing. You can see what's happening. This is the final. Kind of state we have the equal sign one there. So at this point, we have a maximum and time distance. Um, then, my thing is all points of F, G, and then we can measure again. And I think this protocol is the categorical version of what we had on the board earlier, where F's and G's are the use to the power of something we have. Why do you think it's measuring the final modification? Do you have a big curve or not? Yeah, that's true. Right away. So actually, my definition that I'm going to take now will not care about the right-hand part because I'm going to do some other things on the right-hand part like to believe that it can be a bit faster. That's what we used to call phase. Yes. Well, exactly. phase so in the case of the space, yeah. this will be exactly the phase. Yeah. Which takes diagonal, right? It's diagonal in respect to the phase. So unitary and phases. Yeah. Um, but the important ah. definition is the waiting for. So this is the general form of such a protocol. The protocol, so that's now just a different word for morphism. Three wires, which can take any number of wires. So F1, 2, FN. It's sequentializable. And you can also write it as uh, one of the equals. And you can do the same thing on one wire. It doesn't matter in which order I do these things. So that's the definition. Right, so the question then becomes, what protocols are sequentializable to this list? That's the main question I want to address. And we come down to two sub-questions. Question number one is, first of all, what are the classical structures that we need them to formulate things?
Things and my yeah. collaborator is interested in, in the protocol type of things, so that's how we try to talk things together. So let me just talk about these mathematical questions for the rest. Um, so the Capri and Hilbert space is not so very interesting. What quantum information people are really interested in is the Capri and completely positive maps. Should I recall what this is, I suppose? So I suppose you're given a dagger compact category C. So this is the actual geometry. We are called protocol models. Then they're not. Yeah, they're not phases, but they're stainless. They're just normal operators. They're just stainless. All of the areas have to be the same.
So there's a theorem for compact, sorry, completely positive morphisms in number spaces called the Steinspring theorem, and it says the morphism is completely, co completely positive if and only if, if it's of this form. You can just lift that form to a definition that works better. Usually the, the size spring they, they, they use unity extensions well that's what goes from that the real thing. So this is what people tell you, it was a big contribution to the integral multi-panic program. The, the way you can think about it is like you take a morphism and you couple it to the environment and this Z is like coupling to the environment. So you make sec you make a second copy of that system and then you trace the environment out between the two copies. That's how I think about it. It's like a mixed operation. As you get a mixed state versus a pure state. So these are to create mixed operations. Well, what we're really interested in as physicists, well I'm not a physicist, but what physicists are really interested in is not just the thing possible, but also trace preservation. So these are the maps that map states to states. So you can make new categories, which new objects are still. Trace just means if I close this off, it should be the same as closing this off and the other things. Okay, so this is a new category, but this is not a very interesting, or at least not a pretty category to work with, because you pretty soon find out that CPTPC does not have a dagger. For example, let's say, let's say, so this is this metric in the middle. But it does not have a dagger, because if I turn this condition upside down, there's no reason why it should hold, if I just know the right way of version. And what's worse, it's also not compact. In fact, it's only compact if something really degenerate happens. The dimension of any object equal to the dimension of the scapers. That's quite easy to see, because the dimension of an object is defined as this thing. And you can rewrite that as Preserving means it's the same as plugging in nothing and from eye to eye. So it's really a problem for that. So this is only an interesting category when it's degenerate. We obviously don't want that. So an easy way to say this is that the tensor unit is terminal by your definition. And if you would have a dagger all be compact, then by transposition the term turns to units will be initial and you don't have any state. It's a very nice way to put it. There's a one-line group anyway. Huh? It's a one-line group in either case, but that gives you more structure. Uh, so right, so we have a tensor product but not a dagger, so we can't even speak about Frobenius algebras in this country. So I will refer to this one and talk about Frobenius algebras in that one, but it will turn out that this is a special case nonetheless. You just can't have that stack if you can Yeah. So, of course, we want to have that. And then you can be in yourself regular to make the object self dual, therefore compact, and therefore, yeah.
consider completely positive maps. So this category and also what, what Frobenius offers in it are. Uh, first of all, there's always an embedding of category in its CP. This takes an object to itself. It's a line because it goes in different categories. It takes a morphism to standard here. So this is just x to x. So this is always a functor, and you can easily see that this functor is a dagger functor, a preserved dagger, under this strong symmetric model. So it preserves tensor products on the nose. Uh, please go with the symmetry. So it's a little dagger preserving functor. Right, and as soon as we have a strong symmetric model functor, that always preserves for being So it's probably any Frobenius algebra you can see gives you one in CP of C. And classical structures in CP of that sort of a whole trivial. Now the conjecture is that's why it's still ongoing work. Quite certain that is the case, and I'll tell you later on, um, that any Frobenius algebra in any CP of C is trivial. So these are really all the ones you get, the simple ones that come from the base country. Um, trivial is a big word here. Yeah, it's just They're a word. not trivial. <laughs> So in the sense of this construction, they are the trivial ones. Yeah. Well, we can all talk. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. They are not trivial. And the first thing on the way to this kind of insight is there's also a function the other way. Uh, we call that my G. And again, this functor is strong symmetric modal and preserves diagrams. So, diagram tensor. So, again, you get a corollary, any kind of convenience uh, algebra in CPC, the ones that we're looking for. Convenience algebra. That's what you mean, because you know the definition of a line that connects the line. Definition of CPC on the left. You oh, mean yeah, you're right, sorry, that's not what I mean. You mean okay. that whole thing. I mean this one. With the trace and the yeah. Thanks. Uh, what was it? So for being this algebra in the category of CP maps, gives you and gives you one uh, in C, one in C, but on a different object, namely X star tensor X. Yeah, and that takes some checking because you have to take all these kinds of spot things into account all the time. But it does actually turn out to be The worst part is you have to say something about coherence isomorphism and the lower stars of it. So let's have a look at, for example, the category of sets of relations because there we also know what things are. So if C is sets of relations, then, you know, we want to know what the CP, sorry, what the Frobenius algebra is in the CP is here. So by that corollary, we get something on saying 
these algebras of digital union of abelian groups. Did you use that? Did you say what CP is? Yeah. So relation from x underline to y underline, so that's really a relation x times x to y times y. The CP So we know that um, the relation R we look, we have the relation delta is the union of completely, sorry, a union of abelian groups. So let's just read, take a look at this first condition and rewrite what the relation means. So then you have, so this is now you know, a four tuple. It says A, B plus C, D. The group is abelian, so I'll write it as a plus. If I take AB to be zero, and this pulls out, and that pulls out. So that means C equals E if and only if C equals F. And the other way, so we have to have the C equals D and E equals F. So in other words, the classical structure had to be trivial. Alright, so in this category, we're good. Of course, we're really interested in the category of those pieces. So we have a similar strategy as here, right? So first we start with the previous algebra. We take the previous algebra to the CP at the hill. We use that corollary to map it down to a previous algebra at the hill. So when we specify on the objects here are the form H. CN from the line, the definiteness. So uh, that gives uh, delta uh, in different hill. Now a different object maybe uh, CN is And this we can identify with n by n matrices. Delta corresponds to gives the corresponding on the basis of that total space. So we have to classify all the normal bases of matrix algebras. Oh sorry, we know that our delta is of this form, and then the question is when is this delta CP? When is the map And 
to us after that's a rather tough question. But, well, you can get some results. For example, there's a choice theorem. It tells you precisely the different if you should go in and map a CP, so you can write that down, of course, but it's not very informative. It tells you delta is CP. Just an if, sorry, if you only if a certain matrix is positive or definite. That matrix has horrible entries. Check if you like. Is that say delta J E to C prime? Yeah, so J delta prime is the matrix in C C C N to the N to three. Okay, so you can imagine that it's not fun checking this kind of thing. This condition is help. But it does give us a condition and an answer to question four. thing you can really check is, for example, suppose you take the Pauli basis of the matrix algebra, then you can see that this matrix that you get out is not completely positive by the choice theorem. In fact, it's not even positive. So the Pauli basis is not an example of the previous algebra in clean plus maps. write a Mathematica program which checks this horrible condition. And we did that, we generated uh, random bases. So just picking random numbers, you can often normalize it by ground truth, so random often normal bases of MN. And then you can just check this condition. It turns out never to hold, except of course in the canonical case. So I say that's fair numerical evidence, but it really doesn't tell you a lot. You mean it never helps in the experiments? Oh uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. the cash Some kind of statistical You haven't ruled it out, probably, since I expressed Yes. So I can't prove it, that's a problem, so you have to do some proof things. Let me unlock that something that you can say. We have some necessary conditions and a long, sorry, some, yeah, some necessary conditions. For example, if delta is CP, then Following things hold. First of all, the basis that we're considering, the basis that delta is copying, is closed under sticky adjoints. So this does not mean that every of the basis elements have to be self-adjoint. It means that if I take a copyable so a basis element, I take this adjoint, that's again a basis element. A similar thing is also closed under taking absolute values. Now I have to do the zero copy to so be romantic. Uh, if delta CP, then it must satisfy this. It must be almost multiplicative. If I take any two matrices A and B in the uh, MNFC, and I multiply them when I take the delta of them, then apart from the delta of the identity matrix, that's just multiplication of the two appliances of delta. Um, and you can get from so this is a class relies on the classical result by Gartner and this will rely on a generalized form of the no-cloning theorem by our partner and on the cheapest. If you have two optical things which happen to be a positive definite, then they must be so it gives you some restrictions on the basis we're looking at already. For example, the polybase that we looked at does satisfy all this, but this is obviously not necessarily sufficient. And the theorem, which I want to end up with, is a very big list, 24 in one of shoes, that tells you so that is in the classical structure.
second of all, delta is trace preserving. This is the connection to the cathode ray action. If you impose the additional condition that the map should be trace preserving, then you definitely only end up with a canonical ones. As you see, the problem is with checking when something is CP is all the books about completely positive maps automatically assume that things are unital as well, trace preserving. So all the theorems are about what, what delta does to what. So we have this. In terms of the basis, all your basis type elements should have trace one, or what's equivalent should have bank one. And we end with this one. So in the spirit of those kinds of conservation conditions, alpha should be closed under multiplication. If I take two copyables and when I multiply them, So we put these questions to some experts on completely positive maps, and nobody seems to know. Any one of you happens to recognize where one of these conditions hold? Okay, please turn on. Oh, and there, thank you. Thank you. 
Go on, do something funny. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not sure.